John, we want to talk about leadership and how, how people view leadership. But in the Greco-Roman world, how did people view leadership then? Well, there are different kinds of leaders. And I think you can tell what a culture really values by the leaders that it elevates and honours. And surely there were philosophers uh, who were regarded as great leaders, you know, the, the Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and so on. And so these were revered for their intellectual prowess and were honored as such. Uh, but certainly by the time of the first century, it was pretty much a military culture. And so in Greece and Rome, which had had centuries of you know, very little but fighting people and establishing their rule over different kinds of people. By that period, the greatest leaders were, of course, the military leaders. And th this blended with the kind of the early imperial period where the great um, emperors were military. I mean, you almost by definition had to be a military man to be emperor. So, of course, we all know about Julius Caesar, um, Augustus. And so this um, ability to conquer was at the heart of leadership for Greeks and Romans uh, in this very period. Um, wealth, I think, would be another marker of a great leader. And so if someone were e exceedingly wealthy, um, which probably meant their family was well connected with power, then they were also accorded honor and were, were regarded as, uh, as leaders and benefactors. So they were people that you could hang off and, um, and receive the crumbs from their table, as it were. Yeah. So philosophy, military, political power, and wealth were what leadership fundamentally uh, was about. Did, did, the, did the way they saw their gods or the Greek gods, did that influence how they functioned in a leadership level? Well, of course, um, the Greek gods were warriors. And so you read the Iliad, which is you know, the, the classic Greek text, and the Greek gods are very good warriors. And so there's a sense in which um, they led the way in, in military prowess, but one could, one could better describe that as the gods reflected the ideals of Greece, the military Greece. But the curious thing about ancient Greek and Roman religion compared to the modern notion of religion is that ethics wasn't really connected to God. The gods weren't that interested in how you lived other than that you gave them due honor through offerings, through the various rituals, through marking the days that, that were set aside for that God. Um, but how I treated you was just not part of the mix. Um, the connection between ethics and um, belief in God is uh, a, a one given by Judaism and inherited by Christianity and um, via that given to the Western world. Our very notion of religion is different from how Greeks and Romans viewed it. Wow. If you go to the person of Jesus, so Jesus comes into that culture, um, how did he shift our thinking about leadership? Because it's quite crucial, isn't it? Well, Jesus comes into an environment where you've got the greatest empire the world had ever known, an empire that eclipsed the Greek empire. And no one thought anything could eclipse the Greek empire, Alexander the Great and so on. But the, Ro the Roman um, uh, infrastructure um, brought such an amazing hold on the Mediterranean and beyond. So everyone knew who was in charge. And Jesus is born into this very um, powerful context. But he's part of a very different tradition. He doesn't come from the Greek and Roman tradition. He comes from the Jewish tradition, which had begun already in the later prophets of the Old Testament, begun to say really bizarre things like, God likes the poor. Uh, and, and even God likes the humble. But in those texts, the humble are really the humbled, those who have been crushed by oppressors. But you've got this beginning motif of the God of the universe actually having quite a soft spot for those who are down low, who have been crushed low. So, so, so Jesus comes into this enormous empire from his own Jewish tradition, knowing that God loves the humbled. But the the curious thing that Jesus adds to that Jewish tradition is the decision to be humble. Not simply to be humbled by outside forces, but a decision to lower yourself uh, for the sake of another. And he said very 
humble oriented things like, you know, whoever wants to be um, first among you must be your slave. Um, he, he said, even I did not come to be served, but to serve. And so he said things that turned upside down what you'd normally expect of leadership. But the historical moment that changed everything was not so much his teaching, but his crucifixion. Because in the crucifixion, power is given up in such a, an extraordinary way. Um, the cross was viewed, crucifixion generally was viewed as the ultimate punishment in the Roman Empire, the lowest point in the world, you could say. And yet the Christians believe Jesus chose to go there. Not that he was humbled, not that he was crushed, but that he'd willingly given himself. And so they had, they had a choice. Does this mean Jesus wasn't as great as we thought? Because there he is on a cross. Or does it mean we have to change what we think about greatness? It really does seem that the turning point, and when I say this, I just mean it historically, not theologically. The turning point in history, in terms of this motif of the humble leader, is the crucifixion of Jesus where the Christians spotted that to be truly great means to lower yourself for the sake of another. It isn't to deny your own status. Jesus, of course, knew he had quite a heavy, large status, but he chose to orient it toward the good of others. And we can date this pretty precisely because um, you suddenly get in the middle of the first century, shortly after Jesus' crucifixion, you, sh you get texts that use the word humility which had meant to be crushed or to be humbled by another. You start to see it used as a virtue, a positive virtue, to humble yourself for the sake of another, just as Jesus did. Before that time, if you met somebody, would they ever see humility as a virtue? Only if you were humble before an emperor. So the, the emperor would expect you to be humble because that means subservient. Mm. But um, no one would ask the emperor to be humble to anyone. That would be a perversion of the natural order because the natural order had put um, the emperor, but, but senators, um, military generals, had placed them in, their, in that position. That's what nature intended. And therefore, greatness deserves honor. And giving honor to the great was a fundamental feature and aspiration of Greek and Roman culture. You must honor the great because nature has intended this. And you can see it's logical. It only sounds a little bit bizarre to us because we've forgotten what it's like to live in, in, a, in a world where you just think nature intended the great to rise to the top and those who aren't so great to honor them. Mm. Perfect sense, makes perfect sense. The idea that the great as part of their greatness would lower themselves like a servant is so illogical in a Greek and Roman mindset as to be perverse. And this is why you don't get the word humility used the way we now use it. You only find it in Christian texts in the first century. By the end of the first century, outside of the New Testament period, you start to get um, a very frequent use of tapenos, humility language in um, Christian texts. And um, by the fourth and fifth centuries, everyone's starting to use humility in this way. And so we can actually track the influence of Christianity on general notions of power and greatness. And it all comes back to the crucifixion of Jesus. So John, do you see that change in humility and that change in attitude to humility in the general community? Oh, definitely. I mean, the, the very curious thing today is that you don't need to be the least bit Christian to think humility is wonderful. That's just the influence of Christianity. It's now, you don't even have to believe the Jesus story. If you are born in the Western culture, you grow up with this kind of background idea that the truly great serve. And so uh, you find it amongst all sorts of people. Um, uh, your business leaders are now discovering uh, that humility is one of the most central um, virtues of, of good leadership. And so there's very famous studies put out by Jim Collins and others, um, finding that the, the best leaders are the humble leaders. And you even think of the people we value um, in recent times, Nelson Mandela, I mean, I think people would agree in the last sort of 50 years, um, he might be the, the greatest leader, um, the one that we revere. And everyone said about him, he was humble. He, he, he knew what gifts he'd been, he'd been given, but he used them for the sake of others. So yeah, we, we find it everywhere. And, and when we bump into a great person who only wants to talk about themselves, 
we are all repelled, right? Um, unconscious that that's really the influence of the Jesus story on our culture. Whereas in antiquity, of course the great would talk about themselves. In fact, you were obliged to talk about how great they were as well, because that's what the natural order demanded. We've just come to despise the honor seekers and prize humility in a way that is, that would have been bizarre to a Greek and Roman, but is just the air we breathe today. You've written about this, which is why we want to do this interview. How would you describe, um, explain humility? Because it's kind of tough to describe. It's a deliberate lowering of yourself for another person. So um, one way to think about it is to hold whatever power you've got, whether that's beauty or intelligence or money or physical prowess, to hold it for the good of others. So it's not really having a low view of yourself. After all, if you think about Jesus, um, he didn't have a low view of himself, but he, he knew um, that his power was most beautifully expressed in using that for the sake of others. So humility needs, needs to be distinguished from just feeling bad about yourself. Someone with low self-esteem isn't necessarily humble. Of course they can be humble, but one, one could even make the argument that you need a pretty good self-esteem to be genuinely humble because it's only when you really know what gifts you have that you can go, you know what, they're not for me, they're for, they're for others. And as soon as you, you make that noble choice to use your power for others, you're doing what the New Testament and the early Christian writings call humility based on what Jesus did in being one of immense power, uh, willingly going to a cross. Because the church went through a period of time where it was almost worm theology. You know, I can do nothing that's, that's, that's not for me. You're saying that the feeling okay about who you are, understanding yourself is actually part of the process. I think we're all um, a little bit um, schizophrenic, metaphorically speaking. We can either go from the kind of worm theology uh, to a sort of overblown power theology um, and missing that what real humility is, is the recognition of all that you have, but, um, but reoriented toward the good um, of others. And so some of the most humble writings you'll ever um, read in antiquity um, say St. Augustine's um, reflections. Some people could pull out quotes from St. Augustine's The Confessions, one of the most influential documents in Western history. Um, and it sounds like Augustine thinks he's nothing. He's a worm and, you know, cause he'll talk about how fallen he is and da 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 da. But that's to miss the way the whole thing is embedded in this, this theology that says, but I'm made in God's image. God loves me. Um, I'm, I'm a child of God. And, and there's a sense in which you are more secure if you know this God, this will be Augustine's way of putting it. You're more secure when you know him to lower yourself, to be honest about your fallenness. So it's not worm theology or an overblown power theology. It's uh, this beautiful combination of both. You lead a church, you're in leadership. How, how do you hold that tension for yourself personally? Not very well, no. <laughs> I'm basically arrogant good all day long. Are. Good to ask though. <laughs> well, you know, and to be honest, I'm, I'm really embarrassed that I ever wrote on this topic. Um, you know, and I got into it completely by accident, just as a, a, a post-doctoral um, research project at Macquarie University. Uh, so I was accidentally drawn into studying ancient humility. Um, but, you know, and I became fascinated by it and I noticed that tons of other modern secular writers were writing about it and, and didn't know the sort of background um, history of it that we've talked about. Um, so I have a love-hate relationship with humility. I love it, I aspire to it, but I hate the fact that I rarely attain it. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm cool with that because actually my security is, is found in, in the knowledge that God really likes me and loves me <laughs> and regards me his child despite me. Yeah, well, but what are the times that you kind of go, what, like what are the grounding things for you in that whole process? Um, in terms of pursuing humility, do you mean in particular? Mm. Mm. Well, the, the thing that the Jesus story does give me is um, a second thought about what I'm doing. So I tend, well, I hope, uh, when I act in ministry or you know, um, my work in the public, um, I, I try not to act instinctively. Because when I act instinctively, it's the, it's the arrogant Dixon that you know, wants to be on show. Um, but I always have a second thought. As a, as a kind of, not so much what would Jesus do, but what does the Jesus narrative, if true, mean about what is most real 
Because if it's true that at the center of world history, at the center of the universe, is absolute majesty giving himself for others, if, that, if that's at the heart of everything, that means that the most real thing is humility. And so the most authentic way of living, not just a tactic for leadership, the most authentic way of living is to recognize what you have, but reorient them to the good of others. You know church history very well, and you work within the church, and the church has not always done this particularly well. How do you hold that tension? I know the church has been fabulous, Carl, through all of its history. <laughs> um, That's what we were about to say. <laughs> Yeah, look, I mean, the, part of the problem with being a student of history is that I, I know more than most how bad it got. You know, I know where the bodies are buried. And um, you, you just got to be honest about that. Um, and Christians have never really thought that they are good through and through and only getting better. That's kind of secular m motif. Um, Christians have never believed that. And I would hate to believe that. If I woke up every morning going, uh, you know, I'm good through and through and only getting better, I would make it to about breakfast before I knew that wasn't true. Um, and so Christians ought to be um, able to recognize the fallenness in even our greatest heroes. The greatest church leaders are also fallen characters. We wa I wanna own up to that and yet make clear there's another motif that is truer to Jesus. And this is the motif of humility. This series is called Jesus the Game Changer. For you, how is Jesus the Game Changer? There are obviously all the kind of historical things that we've talked about, and, and I love those. But if I'm honest, the, the most game-changing thing in the, in the whole Jesus narrative is the thought that God Almighty, according to the New Testament, um, suffered the betrayal of friends, um, public injustice, brutal torture, and a final breath. If that's true, if that's God going through that, this does change everything because it means despite the things in the world I don't get, the, the pain and the evil that I just don't get, I can't say God doesn't know what that's like. I can't say God can't be trusted because there's this moment that changes forever my picture of God. He can't be the remote, aloof, power-hungry puppeteer. He is the one who would rather give himself through violence and injustice and, and the betrayal of those closest to him. He would rather go through that for me than to see me lost from him. Forever. I think that changes everything.